All right. Uh, so we have a few more people who have joined us uh, while the rest are still continuing joining us today. Uh, thank you all for taking time to join us today uh, for Built with Mercury workshop uh, on a Saturday morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are today. Uh, and right before I dive in and introduce our speakers for today, uh, as mentioned earlier on, for those who are already and those who have just joined us, you can scan the QR code that you see on the bottom right hand of your screen right now with a mobile phone to help us uh, answer some of the survey questions that we do have to get to know you a little bit more. For those, if you don't have your mobile phone, there is nearby you, don't worry about it. You can actually go onto your browser and enter in www.menti.com and put in the code 77345732 to actually access the survey as well. For those uh, who are joining us uh, via the YouTube live as well, uh, thank you and welcome. So let me just dive in quickly for what we are in here for today. Uh, for today, we are. this workshop is really part of the Mercury Hackathon uh, that is uh, actually happening from the 20th of September to 31st of October. And for, for this hackathon, it's really talking about uh, innovating, redefine boundaries, and build amazing technologies and all. And of course, uh, the reason for all these workshops that we are actually doing, uh, it's that we have even from last week or the whole of the hackathon even to today, is really to equip you with a little bit more technical understanding and you know some practical uh, uh, experience on building on this uh, technology as well. So uh, before we actually introduce the two speakers that we have for today, uh, right now, if you are still joining us, do use your mobile phone to actually scan the QR code to access the self-paced activity that we have for you. And uh, if you are joining by browser, you can go on and enter www.menti.com and enter the code 77345732. For those who are joining us on Zoom, you would actually have seen a message over there that is actually posted up, uh, which will be much more easier for you as well. So let's take a quick look uh, and see how is everyone feeling today. It's great to see that most of the people are feeling really positive for today, being excited. A uh, couple of people who are sleepy, I'm not too sure whether that's because it's very early on your end or it's really late uh, on your end, uh, but thank you for actually joining us. Uh, apart from that, uh, let's just see where most of the people are coming from. We do have a majority of people from Singapore, India. We have some from Denmark, some over the internet, uh, specifically speaking. Even as we continue this session, do continue to put in your, um, your inputs as well. Uh, and just a quick check on who are the people that are over here today. We Just to see which of the track are you working on for the hackathon. It's great to see that we have kind of uh, a fan mixture uh, where we have almost the majority of people working on the Filecoin and Flow uh, com combined uh, track as well. And that's great. So quick question to just figure out where everyone is. Uh, we are actually in the third week of the hackathon. Um, and right now we are seeing that we have about a quarter of people who are around 25% in for their projects. We have um, the rest of the 75% of the people who are around halfway mark. Just uh, I'll cover through later on as well on what are some of the key things that you can take note of while you're working on your projects. And uh, you, know, you have resources that are actually available for you. So right now, uh, I'd like to actually introduce uh, our first speaker of the day, uh, Jacob, who is a decentralized applications engineer from the Scientology team. And for today, uh, he will bring you through an introduction of a depth starter, uh, which is to dive deeply into the topic of how to build an NFT project uh, for Flow using IPFS. So this 30-minute session will really be covering uh, what depth starter is, uh, the basics of creating NFTs, and also leveraging IPFS with Flow technology. So Jacob, please take the stage. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's uh, it's me, Jacob here, and uh, um, so excited to uh, see all of you. For those of you that are that are a bit sleepy, hopefully we can hype you up uh, and get you back in the uh, in the space here. So I'm going to share my screen, um, and hopefully all of you can see uh, this uh, this Dapp Charter page. So 
what I'm going to kind of walk through today is what actually is DAP Charter uh, and why it might be helpful um, in developing uh, your uh, decentralized applications. Um, and hopefully uh, you walk away feeling really excited um, and also, uh, you know, walk away thinking that I am the uh, best speaker here. Just kidding. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So what actually is DAP Charter? Well, if you go to dapcharter.decentology.com, um, you can see that, you know, it, it brings us uh, this page. Um, and what we can do is we can kind of walk through step by step and start building a decentralized application. Um, and we don't even have to code anything. So we can start uh, with step one here. Um, and you'll see that it gives us a bunch of blockchains that we want to choose from. And so in this case, you know, we're going to choose Flow. So it's already selected for us. Um, and then this languages section already has uh, Cadence pre-selected for us because that is the smart contract language for the Flow blockchain. And then we can scroll down and uh, we're going to, you know, select our framework. You know, you could choose React if you want to, but I'm going to stick with vanilla JS. Um, and then we can go to our foundations. And so what foundations are is they're almost like pre-built um, ideas around what a Flow project could be. And so... In this example, you know, we have a, a bunch of uh, foundations here. If we wanted to, we could click on a, uh, a ballot voting, which is a simple DAP with uh, smart contracts that are already configured to help you deal with ballots and voting on the blockchain. Um, and you can see that it even has uh, IPFS integration here. And so we could choose this one if we want to. And there's other ones, including a PAC NFT. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, an example decentralized application uh, that is sort of similar to like MBA Top Shot, if you've heard of that. So what these foundations do is they come with uh, uh, smart contracts um, and they also, you know, come with like a client and testing already for you. So we're really selecting a whole, um, you know, package of cool stuff when we select our foundation. Um, and so what we're going to do for this uh, example is we're just going to go with a simple NFT, very simple. Um, and you can see that it is a simple NFT with IPFS integration. So um, we're just going to go with that one and, uh, you know, hope for the best. Um, and so then what you do in your, uh, you know, the last step is you do your dev name. So you don't have to pay attention to this at all. Um, you know, th there's, there's nothing really going on here. I'm just like randomly typing stuff. Um, so once you randomly type your, your dev name um, and have no idea what you typed, you just, uh, <laughs> you click uh, create dev. And what it's going to do is it's going to auto generate um, you know, it's going to auto generate a full stack decentralized application for you. And remember, um, you don't have to do any of the uh, actual uh, coding here. Um, it just it uh, does this for you. And so it'll give you an actual GitHub link that you can click on um, and it'll take you to a GitHub repository with uh, all the code in here. So this is the full stack application uh, for you. Um, and it gives you a bunch of prerequisites uh, you'll need. You know, you'll need Node.js, Yarn. Um, the flow CLI, of course, because we'll be running stuff on the emulator. Um, and there's some, there's some simple instructions here. Um, but I do want to point out that currently uh, we are actually um, we're, we're uh, figuring out a way to do this in a, a cloud container. And we actually have. And so that's, uh, that's in beta testing right now, where we'll have all of this uh, already pre-configured inside of a cloud container so that you actually won't have to have any dependencies at all. Um, and you could just simply run it in the cloud and it would work uh, just fine. So if you're interested in that, uh, we're, we're still uh, kind of testing through that, but that's going to be coming soon. And we're, uh, we're really excited about that. Um, so what we can do is actually go back to uh, our, our, our DAP Shutter page. Um, you know, you could download a zip if you wanted to, but I'm just going to uh, uh, copy this link and I'm going to go to my terminal um, and just git clone uh, this. Um, I'm going to git clone uh, this repository. And so if we actually, uh, I'm just going to CD into this uh, and you'll, you'll notice it, it, it generates a random name, um, but this is just so that, you know, you can recognize your, your, your DAP server project, um, you know, uh, as a repo here. So we're going to go back to our terminal. Um, I, get, I CD'd into uh, my repository. And I'm just going to clear this so that it's uh, more easily uh, viewable. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off the, uh, the yarn process here. So what this is going to do is start uh, installing all the dependencies, and we use Lerna uh, to do that. Um, and this might take a bit. So usually when I when I do these sorts of demos, I pull up a Flappy Bird and I start trying to see what my high score can be. Um, but instead of doing that, um, I know that would be really exciting. But I'm going to open this up in VS Code while we're yarn installing, um, and so that way we can start to actually like view our project here. Um, 
And I'm going to uh, just uh, pull this over to the right um, and I'm gonna take uh, my browser and pull this over to the left so that we can view both at the, at the same time here. All right. And if, uh, if anyone wants me to increase the uh, font size, I'd be happy to do that as well. So it's still uh, Yarn installing. And so while it's doing this, um, I'm just gonna kind of walk through uh, what DAP Charter um, actually is and what this code means. So it might be a bit um, you know, overwhelming at first, but hopefully once I walk through this uh, code from a sort of high level, you can kind of get an understanding for um, you know, what we're actually uh, are doing here. So if you open up packages, uh, there's, there's the three main um, ideas here that, that come with this uh, application. The, the first one is a client. So when you uh, download your um, DAPSitter project, it actually gives you a client for you that you can interact with your smart contracts, your transactions, uh, your scripts, and all this sort of stuff. And so once it, we are installed, I will show you what this client actually looks like. The second one, and arguably the most important, is something called a DAP lib. And so what a DAP lib is, um, is it, it's, we, it, it aims to be a, a sort of, um, besides the contracts folder and the transactions and scripts that you write, it aims to produce something called a DAP lib.js. Um, and this is a blockchain agnostic uh, file that you know you could think of using in your you could use in your mobile apps you could use um, in your separate uh, DApps. It, it's not a specific to DAP Charter. In fact, we've architected it in such a way that you could use it with any application you want. Um, and all of the uh, blockchain specific code is actually inside of the file uh, for that blockchain .js. So all of this code is really blockchain agnostic except for this Flow.js file. And so if you were to go on our DAP Setter page and download an Ethereum project, for example, you would still see a very similar DAP lib and a blockchain JS, but you would just have a, you know, Ethereum specific file instead. Um, and so hopefully you could see that, you know, if you wanted to use this outside of DAP Charter, let's say you had a client uh, that lived somewhere else and you just wanted to pull in the DAP lib.js file, um, you, could, you could do that as well. And I'll show you exactly uh, what this DAP lib.js file um, is. But it looks like we've actually uh, installed our uh, Yarn dependencies. So what I'm going to do is clear this. And I want to show you exactly what DAP Charter even is, um, because I don't want to, um, for those of you that are still feeling a little bit sleepy, I don't want you to uh, feel bored. And so I'm going to show you exactly what we're working towards. Um, and to do that, I'm going to click on, I'm going to uh, uh, type in Yarn Start. Um, and what this is doing, you'll see there's a bunch of stuff that's going to pop up on the screen here. And it looks like there's a lot going on. But what's actually happening, um, I'm going to scroll up a bit, um, is it's, it's auto-generating uh, accounts on the blockchain for us. So a lot of times, you know, when you're developing your, your dApps, uh, there's a lot that goes into it, right? You have to have the CLI, you have to, um, you know, generate accounts, you have to figure out a wallet, you have to configure your transactions and scripts to that wallet. Um, but we actually done all that for you. And so when you yarn start, um, you know, we kick off the client process. Uh, and it, it starts auto-generating accounts for us. And so um, you can see that in the uh, terminal here, it's even showing us the events that were launched uh, from the uh, blockchain that were emitted from the blockchain. Uh, and this is all due to account uh, creation. And so um, all these events, and you can see get account latest and all this stuff is really generating accounts for us. Um, and if we scroll down, you know, it generates five of them. And then what it does immediately after that is it starts deploying all the contracts that are in our project um, and we can see that happening here. So for example, it deployed our non-fungible token contract. Um, it deployed our simple NFT contract. And I will actually show you where that lives inside of our, um, inside of our Decentology project uh, in a sec after I show you um, all the stuff on the client. So uh, you can see that once it deploys the contracts, it actually uh, launches the project and boom, that's what we're seeing on the, on the left here. So. When you launch your project, it'll actually show you dappiness in, in, in big letters. And hopefully you're feeling some dappiness right now. Um, but the, the coolest part uh, that I always think uh, is in the, in the dapp Shorter project is something called a UI harness. And so what a UI harness is, is it's essentially a, um, uh, it, it's a, it's a cool thing that you can use to interact with your transactions and scripts individually on a localized emulator. Um, and it allows you to test uh, your transactions and scripts and your contracts uh, very easily. And so because we have uh, generated uh, a simple NFT project, you'll see that, uh, and actually I might increase the font size and I hope that helps. Um, 
So this uh, uh, makes uh, a, a little a UI harness for us called Simple NFT. And th again, this is because we selected the Simple NFT. But if we had selected a multiple or if we, you know, if you wanted to pull in a separate foundation, it would just create a separate card here. Um, and so we can click on view and it pulls up a whole um, UI harness for us. And so what this is, is you can see there's a bunch of what we call action cards. Um, these little, uh, th these rectangles here uh, with this, uh, these cool, like we call them widgets inside of here and these submit buttons, these are called action cards. Um, and what these are, are, are individual transactions and scripts that you can run to interact with your contracts. Um, and the, the other goal here was that these action cards actually um, work off the previous transactions and scripts that you've run. So for example, if I were to set up an account by giving them an NFT collection, the next action card would keep that state and it would mint the NFT into that collection. Um, and so every time you want sort of a new um, you know, environment, all you would do is just re-yarn start your project and it would give you a fresh emulator, um, which is uh, super awesome. And so what we can actually do is just run through a simple example of exactly uh, what this means. Um, and so let's, let's do that now. So, um, you know, in order on flow, for those of you that have been developing on flow, you know, that there's definitely a process uh, when it comes to, you know, minting an NFT and all that, you have to set up an account. So let's actually do that. Let's set up the uh, admin account um, for, uh, you know, receiving NFTs. And so we can submit this transaction. And what it does is you'll see that if the transaction succeeds, it comes up with a transaction hash. So this is actually the transaction hash um, that was uh, just uh, generated. And this is because the transaction went through. And if we go to our terminal, um, you'll see there's a lot of cool stuff we can see here. Um, and I'm just uh, taking a look in the uh, chat. Oh yeah, so feeling of happiness, uh, let's go. Um, that's awesome. And so uh, well, if we go to our terminal, you'll see that a bunch of stuff was just put here, right? And so it's actually logging all the stuff it's seeing from the emulator uh, right to here. So you'll see, boom, transaction executed with a, with a gold star. And so if you see that gold star, you put your hand in the air and, and it's, it's, it's awesome. So um, that means that it succeeded. Um, and so, yeah, so this is the transaction that was just executed and we provisioned our account or we basically, what that really means is just gave our uh, account an NFT collection. And so let's also do that for the Alice account. Um, and also, you know, this, uh, this right here is something we called a uh, account widget. And so this has a list of all of the accounts that were auto-generated for you. So it has an admin, Alice, uh, Burball, you know, there's a bunch of accounts that we can use and they all have their own address. Um, so this makes testing really easy because if we wanted to, I don't know, maybe transfer an NFT from Alice to Burball, we easily could, right? Just by setting up both accounts and doing that. Um, all right. So what we can do next is uh, we can actually uh, mint an NFT. And for all of you uh, Filecoin IPFS folks out there, uh, this is where uh, stuff might uh, get exciting. So we're gonna uh, actually mint an NFT, but the trick is that the NFT metadata is actually gonna live uh, on IPFS. So um, you know when you store things on the blockchain, it can get really expensive. Um, and you know we don't wanna store entire images on the blockchain because that would just cost way too much. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to actually upload that image to IPFS and store that IPFS uh, uh, hash on the blockchain inside the NFT itself. Um, and that way, if we wanted to, you know, that the person who owns that NFT could read that metadata um, and they could, you know, go to the IPFS uh, URL and see their, their metadata um, on, on the decentralized storage. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. So... Let's actually mint an NFT to the Alice account because we just set uh, Alice up and gave her an NFT collection. We can click on browse files here and it's going to bring up a bunch of files. And so I'm just going to select, uh, you know, I'm just going to select a random file that I want to upload to IPFS. I'm actually going to upload the file that you see in this background here. Um, and so uh, here we go. So this is the Mercury Hackathon background and it puts it right here for us. Um, and so we can keep that there um, and then just click submit. And so when we click submit, it's actually going to, you know, it's going to run the transaction for us. It's going to give us a transaction hash. Um, and if we go to the, uh, if we go to the, the, the log here, you'll see uh, there's an, an event that was emitted, a simple NFT contract deposit. So we deposited an NFT to a collection. Um, and we also see that, you know, wonderful gold star that boom, everything is good to go. Um, so Ken says, can Jacob explain some of the scripts in package.json? Yes. So we can uh, go into that at the end if, um, if we uh, have some time. Um, so, all right. 
So the next thing we want to do is, you know, we just minted the NFT, right? But how do we actually view, uh, you know, what NFTs are, are in the account? So if we were to view the uh, NFTs in the admin account, you would see that there's nothing, right? There's, there's no result because we haven't minted any NFTs into that account. Um, we, but we have minted an NFT into the Alice account. So let's actually click on Alice and view this again. And you'll see, boom, we get zero. And so what this is, is this is the NFT's ID. And um, the way that we have done it is that, you know, NFTs uh, increment their ID starting from zero. And so it'll go from zero all the way up to, you know, infinity if you uh, love NFTs and, and want to be rich on NFTs. But this is the ID that Alice has. And so let's actually now view um, the metadata um, for this NFT, right? We want to see that image that we just minted with that NFT. So let's click on Alice again, because it lives in Alice's account. And let's type in the ID zero. Um, and it'll actually return the metadata associated with this NFT. So it has an ID of zero. Um, and then there's also a IPFS uh, hash here. And so what we can do is we can actually view this um, on IPFS. So if we wanted to, we could go to uh, this link and then copy and paste to the IPFS hash. So ipfs.infura.io slash IPFS, copy and paste our hash and look, boom. So we actually see our uh, Mercury Hackathon Zoom background image on IPFS. Um, and it wasn't, it, you know, it didn't need to be stored um, it, on chain because it would have been super expensive. Instead, we uploaded it to a decentralized storage and now it's living here. Um, and so what we can do is we can actually, you know, let's, let's click on this image and boom, there's, uh, there's the, you know, background that's right behind me. And so everything is working uh, as intended. So super cool stuff. Um, all right. And so I'm looking at chat. Nice. All right. Awesome. Um, cool. So then, uh, you know, the last thing we're going to kind of go over here. And again, you could add infinite amount of things to, to your, uh, you know, UI harness here. But these are just the things that I've set up. And so let's actually transfer the NFT from Alice to the admin with the ID zero. We can submit this transaction. Um, and now, now if we were to go up, you know, Alice would have no NFTs, but the admin would have that NFT with ID zero. So bam, there's, uh, there's the UI harness. Um, these are the, all the action cards we've done. Uh, but the idea is that when you download or you clone a DAP sort of project, um, the, you know, the idea is that you would, you could build off of this, uh, off of this DAP. So while we give you a simple UI harness uh, for you already, um, you know, the, the goal is that you would put in your own smart contracts and you would put in your own transaction scripts and you would make your own action cards to, to fit it however you want. Um, and so let's actually take a look. Um, at exactly what, uh, how that's done inside the project. So inside of your uh, daplib uh, package um, is a folder uh, with all the contracts. And so if we click on this contracts folder, um, and then let's go into flow, for example, you'll see that you know, these are the base flow projects that you would usually use. And so for any foundation that you were to clone, um, you would see that you, know, you have these three contracts always, because these are always super important. And so we thought, why not just throw these in there um, to kind of help you in your development. So for example, non-fungible token, um, we can actually, uh, I'll expand this a little bit. Um, and so for non-fungible token, you know, we can see that there's a bunch of, you know, code here for us, and this is the NFT standard. So if you wanted to make an NFT, bam, here's the uh, standard that you can use. Um, and so can you zoom in a little bit? Uh, how is this? Is this, um, is this good or should I zoom in again? How, how's that? Is that, is that better? Um, cool. Okay. I can see it clearly, fine, okay, awesome. Um, all right, thanks for the uh, feedback, guys. So if you need me to do anything, just uh, let me know in the chat. Um, so yeah, and then what we can do is we can actually go into the project. And so the project folder is the specific contracts that are unique um, to this uh, project that we did, right? So we got simple NFT and boom, it gives us a simple NFT contract for us. Um, and so I'm not gonna walk through um, all, all parts of this contract because we are definitely limited on time. But what I do wanna point out is that look, Inside this NFT resource that we've defined, um, you know, it fits the NFT standard. But the cool thing is that, look, we've included an IPFS hash. So um, I hope that this somewhat proves that, you know, when we upload that, I, that, that, that Mercury image, right, and I uh, submitted that to the, uh, you know, decentralized storage IPFS, it actually is storing that hash within the IPF, IPFS uh, variable here. Um, and so when we were viewing that, you know, on IPFS, it was actually returning the hash that's stored in the NFT. So whoever stored this NFT would have that hash 
um, and they could view it, you know, however they wanted to. And so um, I think that's uh, super cool. And, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff in here, like how do we define a collection? Where are these NFTs stored? Um, but uh, again, just because we're limited on time, we're not going to walk through all parts of that. All right. So the next folder I want to go over is the interactions folder. And this uh, stores all of the uh, cadence code um, for our transactions and scripts. So if, let's just open our transactions, for example, and let's go into mint NFT. Um, bam. So this is the transaction code for actually minting an NFT. And you can see all these, uh, you know, uh, pretty cool comments I've put in here. I, I've tried to, to document this code a little bit to, to help those of you out in your journey. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, you know, all here. Now, I do want to point out also um, that, uh, you know, for those of you that like working on the Flow Playground and like having that, you know, compile time error, well, what we can actually do is uh, I can show you that that exists uh, in this project as well. So let's say I was to, I don't know, let's say I was to modify something here. Um, you'll see it gives me an error and it says cannot find type in its scope, uint6. So it actually gives us compile errors as well. Um, and so let's also like maybe mint uh, or pull up a transaction. And let's say that instead of calling it NFT minter, I called it um, Morgan, right? And so it's going to actually give us compile time errors. It's a cannot find type in this scope, simple NFT.morgan. So it's giving us those errors, uh, you know, uh, for us automatically. And so um, you know, if you like that flow playground experience, you'll get a similar thing here as well. Um, all right. So that's, um, you know, where you would put your scripts and transactions. And again, these are just dot CDC files, you know, so cadence code. Um, and that's all cool. So I've been talking a lot about, you know, the DAP lib. And so let's actually, uh, you know, take a brief look at this. And remember, I said that the DAP lib is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unopinionated. There's no it's not configured for a specific blockchain. So if you were to select any other blockchain, it would look very similar. And we've done this purposefully so that you can bring this sort of dapplib.js file uh, anywhere you go. And so this file contains a bunch of JavaScript uh, functions, um, you know, for example, mint NFT. And these are the functions that your client is calling. And so, uh, you know, truthfully, like if you had a separate client that you wanted to use instead of the UI harness that I just showed you, all it would require would be importing in this uh, daplib.js uh, file, and it would do all of the, the rest for you. Um, and so this mint NFT function, you can see that it's uh, setting a, a the, you know, the IPFS config and it's, it's IPFS uploading. So it's uploading all of our stuff to IPFS. And then what it's doing is running something called blockchain.post. Um, and this is a transaction. So it's running the mint NFT transaction and it's passing in all of our parameters that we have set on the UI harness uh, for us. So uh, super cool, super cool stuff. Um, <laughs> Morgan says, thanks for associating me with errors. <laughs> of course, Morgan. Um, all right. And so I got a question, uh, where can we find all this code? So you can find all this code on the, on the dapstarter.decentology.com website. Um, and then you can uh, select your foundation there, but I will come back to that in a bit since we only have uh, 10 or so minutes. All right. So this is uh, all the functions. And then I do want to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to run through one more quick thing with you, um, and that is going to be a testing, right? So in any, uh, you know, DAP that you have, you, you won't really want to have unit testing. Um, and this is, you know, a recurring theme across any blockchain you're using or, or whatever it may be. Um, and so we actually have, have configured a unit testing into the project uh, for you as well. Um, and so you don't have to do any of that. So, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of people using DAP Charter. Um, to, uh, you know, to have unit testing for uh, like deploying contracts to mainnet because the flow team requires, uh, you know, unit tests in order to deploy your contracts to mainnet. And so a lot of people have used DAPSharder for that. And I will show you exactly uh, what that is as well. So instead of typing yarn start to launch our project, if you instead type yarn test, what it'll do is generate those accounts for you automatically. It'll deploy your contracts and then it'll run uh, all the uh, unit tests that we have defined previously. So under simple NFT, Boom, it's running a uh, user has no NFTs uh, uh, unit test. It's running a mint NFTs in the user account unit test. And boom, it says six passing with flying check marks. Uh, we're good to go. Bam, all our unit tests are working. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's cool as well. And so where that's actually happening is inside the DAP lib in the test folder and simple NFT tests. You could walk through all these tests. These are just, uh, you know, configured with uh, just JavaScript. Um, and you can also see that, you know, the, the, what I was saying about that daplib function, you know, it can really be called from anywhere, right? Uh, it, it's being called from our client, but it's also, look, we're using that same daplib function that we were using for our client 
inside our test uh, folder as well. So it's it, all it's doing is calling those Daplib functions that the client would be calling and passing in you know hard coded parameters for a unit test. So if we wanted to change this and have it fail, we could update this to zero or, or whatever it may be, um, and it would fail those uh, those tests. Um, and so yeah, so it's using our Daplib function that we've defined uh, pretty much everywhere. And so I'm checking the chat again. Um, all right, so everyone's, uh, this is good, this is good. Um, yes, and unit testing can be very painful. Um, all right, so I'm gonna kind of take a pause there since we only have eight or so minutes left. Um, I know I just sped through that and there's a ton going on, um, but I just wanna know if anyone has any questions about you know uh, th this, uh, this Decentology project. So um, thank you for answering those questions. Okay, so, so this question's already answered, perfect. All right, so yeah, so anyone has any questions? So it seems like you did a killer job making minting NFTs easy. Thank you, Jim, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, really the whole point of this was that, you know, like anytime you wanna get started with a blockchain, there's so many things going on. You know, you have to, you go to the docs, so there's just lists and lists and lists of stuff to, to, to download and it's, it can be really confusing. So the whole goal here was to try and get you started in your DAP development, um, you know, without the, the pain of having to figure out how accounts are made figure out how to write your transaction code. We've done that for you. And so you can really, you know, what, what we always say is that our, you know, we hope to bring 80% of the DAP to you and then you would add 20% of the value. Um, but, you know, hopefully even way more than that. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can really uh, achieve, your, achieve your dreams on DAP Shredder. Um, all right. Nice work having the test too. Thanks, Jim. It's, it's really sweet. Is there any resource to develop front end using UI Harness? Uh, is there any resource to develop well, I can actually show you the, uh, so I, I didn't show you the UI harness, but what that is, is actually inside the, uh, the client here. And if you click on source um, and then, you know, go to uh, harness here, we can click on the simple NFT uh, harness. And so, um, you know, we use a lit element for, uh, you know, our, um, our client here, this is using vanilla JS. Um, and there's a bunch of, like I was saying before, there's a bunch of uh, action cards here. And so hopefully uh, you can kind of see how these action cards work just by these examples. Um, although uh, if you're actually looking for uh, direct documentation on how to develop on the UI harness, uh, check out the uh, fast forward uh, repos that we, uh, we did, the fast, the fast forward bootcamp. Um, there's a bunch of resources there and that's actually listed on the Mercury resources page. So remember to check out the Mercury resources page and there's a bunch of stuff on how to do that there. Uh, thank you, Morgan, for linking that. Uh, awesome. And so if you actually were to go to week, uh, week two, I believe, it's uh, one of the later days in the week, and this would exactly show you how to do this on Depth Router. Um, So I can throw HTML, CSS, JS, and UA Harness. Yep, you can. So if you, you know, this is just a client that we've done for you. Um, but if you, if you have any client, you know, you all you have to do is import Daplib right here. So if you have any client, uh, all you do is import the Daplib, and and that's it. Um, and it would it would work. And so there might be some configuration there, but you know, we'd be happy to work through that with you. Um, and so, yes, you can see all these action cards here. You just provide a title, a description, you know, method post because it's a, tra it's a transaction. If it was a script, it would be get your fields. Um, and so, you know, the, the, this is an account widget that's selecting the, an account. Um, similarly, this upload widget. So what we've done is we've abstracted all of these uh, sort of widgets um, into uh, components here. So if you were to open up the components folder, you would see all of these widgets here for you. So that uh, widget I was showing that selects accounts that's been abstracted into something called an account widget. Um, you know, that, that little IPFS a box that allowed us to upload files to IPFS, that's been abstracted into an upload widget. So you could also use these components in any uh, project that you have, um, and they would be configured and ready to go for you. Um, and so, yeah. So uh, is there a adapter in TypeScript 2? Um, I don't know if, I, I don't believe so. Um, right now, we just have a vanilla JS and uh, React. Um, but there's definitely uh, more um, frameworks to, to come. Um, we're trying to, you know, do this for a, a variety. So, um, yeah. Smiley faces in the chat. Oh, I, I hate when it converts my smiley face. I, I, there we go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, I think it might be good to take a pause there so that I don't keep rambling and go over time. Um, and I think I've touched on all the, the points I want. So. Um, yeah, and, and I also sometimes get questions about, you know, uh, I'll actually uh, do this here. Sometimes I get questions about, you know, how do I actually make this steps or a project of my own? 
So if you were to just clone this, you know, this uh, your project gets generated into the Dapshutter folder on the Decentology uh, organization. But if you wanted to make this project your own, you could just get clone this, you know, just remove the repo and just, uh, you know, make your own repository and upload it there. You can also fork the repo if you want. Um, and yeah, so hopefully you guys are excited about uh, Web3 development. Hopefully this takes away the pain of having to get started uh, on Web3. Um, you know, we really just want you to have a good experience and uh, we hope to, you know, we hope to see you making some cool dApps. So thanks everybody. And um, um, I, 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 I'm really excited for the next uh, presentation as well. So let's, uh, let's shift over to that. All right. Uh, thanks, Jacob, uh, for the time. Uh, right now, I'm just going to pass the time to Jimmy, uh, who is the webmaster at Protocol Labs, who will actually introduce uh, Estuary to you. Uh, he will cover quickly on, you know, why Estuary is actually being created, uh, and the understanding the mechanics behind it, and also how you can actually utilize it. So, Jimmy, you're up next. Uh, it's going to be a tough uh, presentation to follow. That was really awesome, Jacob. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, get to presenting. So I have a little some slides for you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I work on a team at Protocol Labs that's trying to make Filecoin usable. Uh, it's it's actually um, we're getting closer and closer day by day. We're working with storage providers around the world. Uh, there's a lot of people providing storage, and what. IPFS and Filecoin actually are very similar. So um, I'm excited to show you this node that we've designed at the ARG. Uh, you can see the link below if you wanna learn more about our group. Um, and this node will uh, allow you to easily store data to Filecoin. So Filecoin is actually uh, like an estuary, like IPFS node is actually very complicated. Uh, there's a lot of like things that go into an IPFS node and there's a lot of things that go into running one and uh, being a network operator. And so, uh, you can go through and you can look at the open source code and you can kind of see a ton of dependencies. And, you know, for a developer who just wants to build an app or build a tool, the kind of experience that you really want is something like this. So you just kind of want to be able to upload files without having to look at all of those dependencies and, uh, you know, get to the point, right? So um, another thing that separates what, you know, if you're just using an IPFS node is, uh, when you upload data to Filecoin, you actually can see which storage providers it's on and you can see, um, you know, like the proposal receipts. So for how long that deal is going to be on chain. Um, and so this kind of adds like a little bit more resiliency to your NFTs, for example, because if you have a IPFS pin, um, that IPFS pin is only as resilient as the IPFS node that's holding it. And if it's not pinned, when uh, the IPFS, IPFS node restarts, it gets garbage collected. In this case, um, if it's on Filecoin, what happens is if you pin something and that pin is somehow lost, it can go to Filecoin and retrieve that pin, uh, that CID, and uh, restore it. So none of your users who are having uh, or minting NFTs will ever lose their assets. And that's important because I think people start to care about where it's stored. They want to make sure it's in every country, uh, and et cetera. And so um, what's the point of you know, today's presentation, uh, I'm going to show you a estuary node that you can use. And basically, if you have valuable data and you want to make your data, you know, available to the world, you know, make it sure it's archived and retrievable from anywhere. And you need a simple tool to upload that data. And if you need proof that data exists, uh, this is a presentation for you. And so if you're building something that allows you to mint NFTs really easily and you want to make sure that data is stored off chain and decentralized, uh, we're going to provide you an API that you can use. And Estuary essentially makes uploading that data, replicating data around the world, like a five minute problem. You can log in, upload the file, retrieve the pin CID from any IPFS gateway. Uh, you can use the Infura one that was shown earlier, or you can use one of ours. Uh, and you can trust that we're gonna get that file stored on at least six storage providers. Uh, and then, you know, you have uh, three different options. So uh, you can upload it from a GUI, you can upload a, a CID, uh, directly so you can maintain the Unix FS structure, or you can uh, upload a car file, um, which is a popular choice for uh, people who are developing with Filecoin. And so let's just do a thousand foot view before I get into showing you the product and all the code. Um, you know, let's say we have this world right here and uh, I did, this is like really hastily done, so I'm, I'm really sorry, but these are like 
uh, file coin storage providers would expose pure IDs. It's like a file coin storage network, right? And you have these new S-story nodes. They, be, they are IPFS nodes, so they know of each other and people are uploading data to them. And after that, they're making storage deals against all of these providers. And you can see that this is kind of the beginning of a global network of all the data that you could possibly upload. And so, um, you know, you can imagine this is how things look for NFTs. Uh, you can imagine this for like public data and, and uh, this kind of our, our broader vision for how everything comes together. And so our s node, the one that we're running for everyone to use actually has quite a bit of uh, success. So it's done um, 21,000 successful storage deals. Um, it's had over 8 million files, um, 51 terabytes of pinned IPFS data. So that's like data you can just retrieve from any gateway. So in the previous presentation, Jacob elegantly described how you can just look at that IPFS hash, grab that from any gateway and see it. That's uh, RS Reno also provides 51 terabytes of that. Uh, we've put over three times that amount into total seal storage and deals. So that's backed up. So in case that pin is ever lost, you can get that back. Um, and a single user has gone and done 15 terabytes. So that's pretty, that's a lot of files. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we can get more storage providers and more users, uh, people building platforms like Arzora, um, et cetera, using, using our tool. And so here are some charts. I know people like charts to kind of see uh, the growth. And so a user in this case actually uh, includes like an internet archive or an Arzora or Wolfram Alpha or any major player as well. So we, we treat them all the same. So even if you're a hobby developer, you're, you, you can be a user of s or if you're a big company and you, you're providing platform, the s API works for you too. And that's because like it's written in, uh, uh, elegantly in Go and, and can handle, you know, large scale file uploads. And we also deploy a system called Shuttles, which allow you to upload from any location geographically. And so how do developers use Estuary? And so I'm gonna get to the point here and show you the product. So if you're a developer today, uh, you have, um, we have a, you know, a, a typical GitHub group. We have a lot of people from protocol labs contributing to it. And we have um, an Estuary node repo. And this one's really complicated. So if, if you want to run an Estuary node and you're not super experienced with running network infrastructure yourself, I would skip this. And I would go straight to Estuary Tech, which is our website. And you can kind of see, um, actually, I'm going to log out real quick. My bad. And you can see uh, kind of, uh, if you need to learn more, we have documentation that allows you to actually modify the docs in the, um, you know, uh, in the docs themselves. I think that uh, what I want docs to become are kind of like this place where you can experiment with code while you're trying to learn how the API works. And so um, here we have some commands that kind of express how easy it is to use Estuary from the command line. And you can retrieve this uh, CID from the IPS gateway. And I, whenever I demo this, it's never as fast as I hope. So it's kind of embarrassing. So I'm just gonna leave these links up and hopefully they'll resolve a little bit later. Uh, you can see that since I've made the presentation, we've actually gone over 9 million files, 26,000 deals on chain, um, 200 terabytes of total seal storage. You can see comparisons to um, other Web3 products. Uh, my counterpart, Alan Shaw and Ali have worked on like NFT storage and Web3 storage are both like open solutions that are really awesome. Um, we're invite only. That's why our user account's a little bit lower because we're very selective, but anyone who's participating today in this hackathon can definitely use um, Estuary. And we have a way basically to um, like, you know, see all the storage providers and how well they're doing. So I think that's kind of cool. You can actually like go into the logs and see that, uh, you know, how, how the network's performing and our overall performance. But I'll get to the chase. So I'm gonna log in and you won't be able to do this, but when I give you an invite, you will be able to. Um, and I'm just gonna up demonstrate uploading. So I'm gonna add a file. I'm gonna go into directory and I have all these files here. I'm gonna click open. Cool. So we have queued up 23 files that we wanna upload to the, um, you know, this IPFS network. And so I'm going to click upload all. And uh, you can see parallel uploads happening at the same time. So we're doing, I think, around maybe 23 files. So uh, we'll see how long it takes for one of these to finish. And hey, Jimmy, do you think uh, you can zoom in a little bit? Uh, yeah, I think I can. Sorry, my resolution is like really big on this computer. Um, does this help? Yeah, perfect. It's Thank you. Better. No problem. Yeah, so we'll see which one finishes. Uh, it is nice to get, like, I think, a few files at the same time. 
Each one's about 67 megabytes. So for NFTs, that's I think over the size of typical NFT. So cool. So just like the other example, we get these DWeb links back right away. And I don't know if anyone's been going on OpenSea lately, but the IPFS nodes are hammered. So we're probably not going to see this for a while. Oh, so this one's right here. So almost instantly you can see this video of this castle. And so estuary is a really easy way to get that pin data onto IPFS. Uh, so you can, you know, view videos pretty quickly. Um, and after this is done, so I'm going to open up another tab here and go to the deals. Once you have done all that, you can see that it's working now and trying to upload those files individually. But for previous uploads, you can see these proposal receipts. So you ever have to prove that something's on Filecoin? I can prove that it started August 18th. I did this a while ago. Um, yeah, and the video is buffering because it's it's fresh, just off the press, right? So um, it's I think ideally IPFS gateways get a bit faster and we make this like split second. But uh, for now, I think this works because I think there's still like some time buffering between minting an NFT and and uh, viewing the assets. So um, but ideally, it's a little bit faster. And but for the proposal receipts here. Um, you can see the start end dates. You can see the piece size. You can see which providers uh, storing it. You can also see that the you know this one right here is under maintenance, so it probably won't be storing any files soon. Um, and it's just kind of really cool to see where your data actually is. I think like a lot of times we build these APIs and we don't really know where things are. And I think like this is a good first step to kind of figuring that out. Um, so yeah, like you know, looking at this GUI, I know people are probably wondering, well, gosh, I'm a developer. I don't really like need a GUI, I, I'm gonna add this into my app. And so I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. And I'm gonna show you from our docs actually how to do that. And then afterwards, I'm gonna show you from our, um, from an example web application, just like from scratch, we'll just store a file. So uh, I'm gonna go to my API keys here. And this is probably gonna be a bad idea to do on screen because I, I probably shouldn't expose these. So I'll probably re revoke them all afterwards, but um, come back to the documentation. So some API endpoints like this, they don't require an API key. So you can just call it, right? So if I change this right here, it's gonna break. I change this, it shows the value here. Um, and if I go here to the first part of our tutorial, I can just replace this API key string here with this and ta-da, it works. I have full access to my account on Estuary uh, through the API. And so this is the viewer account and you can see the default deal settings. You can see uh, my Filecoin address. Um, and the different upload endpoints that we have. So that is neat. And after you do this, if I want to upload your first file programmatically. So we have an example using either curl, you can do this from the command line. Uh, you can just copy and paste this curl script and replace it with API key and, or you can just do it here. So I'm going to replace this with an API key. This is vanilla JavaScript. Um, it's wrapped in a react component. I thought maybe some people would use react, but if you're not, you can just copy and paste the bits out of it. Uh, this is just an on-chain callback that happens when you're doing input change. That's the only way it really works in HTML. Um, and then I'm going to upload a file here by clicking choose file. And let's pick a smaller, like nature 13 again, hit open. And you can see that I am essentially live coding how to use the API within the browser. What this means for developers who want to use estuary is that you don't actually have to NPM install anything. You can just use our hosted estuary node via api.estuary.tech and you can use the API endpoints and you can just upload files that way. And that's a really easy way to incorporate into your applications. It's done over HTTP, so it pretty much works in all cases. Um, and after you finish uploading the file, I don't have like more here. I probably could like add like a finished state. You can see that it updates here as well. I can just like write like live code. It has like, you know, it obviously wouldn't save, but you can see that it works with most things. Um, if we go to list data, if I want to see the data I've added, so you're probably going to do two things. You're probably going to upload data and you're probably going to list data. Um, and you want to do some management later, of course. But from here, I can just add an API key and I can see all the files I've added to S3. So um, I think this is really useful to integrate into anything. Um, like you can add this instead of, you know, in Fura's API, you can add this directly into your NFT minting process and make sure the data is off on chain, uh, off chain, sorry, on IPFS, uh, you get the same CID hashes here. And so these hashes are unique. And what's really awesome about IPFS and content addressing is that uh, when we hash the file, we generate a unique ID. And so that's the kind of like 
the, the file is the location. And so it's really, it's, uh, if you imagine a browser that uses IPFS instead of HTTP and you can just navigate straight to the content, I think that's kind of like a neat idea. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So with these API endpoints, you should be able to get started. It probably, hopefully isn't too complicated. And if you, if you want an invite, what I recommend is you go here to our docs and the link is right here. I'll post it in the chat as well. Just request an invite. Uh, please like read this and let me know, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, what you're planning to use the data for. Like we're not that great for private data right now. So you don't want to like, you know, put something personal like your credit card or um, you don't want to put like uh, your passport or anything like that. But if you have public data or NFT da image data, you're probably going to want to like, you know, you just let me know that and I'm more than comfortable giving you an invite. Um, S3 is different from NFT storage in this way. So that's a common question that we get. And lucky for you, I've built a little bit of a comparison. And so right here at the very top, you can see there's NFT storage. Uh, NFT storage is actually uh, designed by uh, 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 a collaborator of mine, Tara. Uh, if you like the smiley faces, huge shout out to her. She did a great job with that. Uh, you can kind of see like the, the comparisons of the three services here. And so um, they're very similar from like a developer um, kind of like a, a developer DX kind of situation, right? But the difference is how we make Filecoin deals. So S3 is predominantly also a Filecoin product. While it's a next generation IPFS node, an improvement on IPFS, IPFS nodes in general using the latest versions of everything. So if you're using another service, they might not have been able to upgrade because they might have scaled on an older version of IPFS. We are using the latest, and then we're also integrating a Filecoin client as well into our S3 node. So that allows us to make Filecoin deals and complete the full story around the resilience of your data. And so uh, Web3 storage and NFC storage actually use other deal brokers as well. Like Textiles, BidBots, absolutely incredible. It's doing over 70 terabytes of storage as well. Um, but we have our own built in entirely. So the reputation system for how well deals are made, as well as um, you know, how we make storage deals are all integrated in a single product. And we think that's like useful for people who want to run their own S3 nodes as well, because you don't have to go down chasing all these other modules. You can just use one complete piece of software. Um, so you can check out this on your own time. Uh, I think you'll find things that are very uh, similar um, and things that are actually pretty different when you get down to this part of the page. And especially how much storage we've made and the amount of deals we've made. And I think we've actually made more deals looking at this 26,000 deals. I think it might've increased since I've started uh, this presentation. So cool. I think uh, once you, uh, and the other, other one loaded as well. So here's the other image from the front page. And so um, all of this is done through uh, the API that you just saw. And API is really just that simple. It's, um, sorry, I lost my place. It's really just plug in an API key, copy and paste it here, um, choose a file, upload a file, and that's it. Um, how can I earn point here? Um, I don't know what that means, um, but I hope, I don't think we have any points on this, but, uh, oh, I see, yeah. So using estuary means you're using Filecoin. As simple as that. So if there's any correlation between, uh, if there's any points around uh, using Filecoin, uh, S3 is probably a very easy way to use Filecoin. And to give you an example, I think you can show someone this page later on. So I think all our files finish up, which is great. Okay, I can leave this page. Um, if you go to our front page, yeah, we'll leave. and you go to uh, compare to cloud, and you go to, actually, sorry, wrong page. Web3 comparisons, and you go here to verify your data is actually on Filecoin. So um, I will give out, I'm probably backlogged about 10 invites. I'm gonna give out probably like 10 or so invites right after this uh, presentation. So after I'm finished, you'll all, you'll all get invites and you'll be using the same infra that Arzora is using in the future and other cool, services. So some, some other services plan to give us a terabyte a day, which is what we're working up towards and be able to handle a terabyte of data, uh, which is a lot of data a day. Um, but I hope that, you know, but in six months or so, we'll be able to handle like, you know, you know, petabytes a week. 
So um, you're going to be in good, you're going to be in good company with these bigger providers. Um, so uh, when it comes to the, uh, the, the hackathon, and if you're trying to prove that you use Filecoin, this is an, a, a CID. Um, Jacob called it an IPFS hash from the previous presentation. But if you have one of these that you uploaded through Estuary, you can just copy and paste it in here. And you can basically prove if it's on Estuary and you can see the size of it. So this, this, this one is 27 gigs. And then you can see which providers have it. And you can also do a retrieval using Lotus, which is the, uh, the software that suite that is made for using Filecoin. So um, this allows you to kind of verify and prove to anyone in the world that your data is backed up on Filecoin, which I think is kind of a badge of honor, knowing that your data is, is backed up and uh, replicated appropriately around the world so that it can be retrieved. Um, so yeah, this is uh, basically how you prove it. Cool. So now that I've kind of shown the, those aspects off, um, and feel free to ask me any questions if you have any, um, let's go look in the S3 repo and let's look at how broad the API is. And so we have here, if you are, you know, if you don't see something that you like in the docs, you can actually come in here and use all of these API endpoints if you have an API key. And I think that makes things uh, pretty interesting because you can basically take advantage of all the things that Estuary provides um, with one API key. So uh, we have collections that we haven't released yet. So IPFS collections is a new feature that uh, I haven't written docs for yet, but uh, that, that's supported as well. We have the standard API, uh, IPFS pinning API. So if you're using IPFS node already, you can actually just move over to our hosted endpoint and it's one-to-one. -one. So there's no changes there. Um, and we're always adding things here. So if you're an open source contributor and uh, you know, if you're an open source contributor and you want to uh, expand what we can offer, you know, feel free to come in and take a look at the code. It's all open source. Uh, Morgan asks, what suggestions do you have for client-side app hosting on the centralized web? Um, I, I think anything that is uh, a static site hoster, because IPFS is better with static sites because we don't need servers anymore. If you think about like, you know, most authentication can be done through MetaMask, um, you know, and, and, and you're, you're kind of authenticating with blockchains, right? So, you know, you don't really need um, to have a centralized auth with a centralized database. Now you might have like a Postgres database that you host somewhere that does the mapping of data, but you don't have to treat it as something that also does authentication as well. And what we're also exploring, uh, which is a good conversation for later, is um, uh, uh, centralized identity. Uh, but we don't have anything that we're going to prescribe just yet, but there'll be many examples coming up soon. Um, so I guess I can zoom in a little bit more. I hope this helps. Sorry about the resolution. Um, cool. So I think that covers uh, mostly Estuary and how easy it is to use. And I think what would be useful is if I show you how to kind of integrate it into your apps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this code that I've, I have this little hello, hello world example right here. And I'm going to open up. Um, this little React example. So this is like the most minimal I can get, right? Like if I just do a console log here and do hello, and I maybe change this to, um, hey hackers, and I inspect, you know, this instantly refreshes, this changes, right? So I have a pretty clean slate here. And so, um, you know, whatever toolkit you use, uh, you know, whatever fresh state you have, um, you can kind of, um, just get started with something simple like this. And the Estuary documentation is really easy. So what we can do is we can go to, um, let's go to the introduction page again, and let's just grab this code, right? So um, we have API point. And so let's do like react.use effect, and then let's do an arrow callback function. We don't want this to update ever again. So we do like a empty array, right? So this is this replaces component did mount. Uh, the example coming out here, if you're using React hooks, use this. And you can have this little fetch call, right? Um, and I don't really like that it's uh, not using async await. So I'm going to actually do a uh, function. I'm going to declare a function inside. So load. Is this really small? I'm guessing this is really small. So let me make this bigger. Can everyone see this? Cool. So then, like, Okay, now we can drop this in here and we can do like const response equals this. 
And then we obviously need to do like an async function, right? So we can use a wait. And cool. And then we want to do like const JSON because we want that JSON response to be formatted as. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Right. And so we have this now. And then, uh, you know, we just do like a load. And then we can do like a set state um, and spread JSON. This, we'll do load and save. And then uh, we can, instead of, um, let me just add this here to state. Right. And then go into the app, see if that works. Response is not defined. Um, that's because I didn't wait this. I misspelled response. Cool. And just like that, I've integrated the Estuary API into another app. It's just that simple. So um, you can do this with uh, file uploading too. So instead of doing something as simple as this, let's uh, let's do a file upload. So we'll go here and we'll go to docs and we'll go to upload data. And um, I can really just copy and paste this. So I'm gonna do that right now. Cool, so I did that. Um, this is going to break because there's no this in the function component. And then, yep. And we can check our page here. And um, that's also going to break as well because that doesn't exist. And we don't need this anymore. Cool. Actually, we take this out for now. We need to write that function. Cool. So you can see a little input. Yeah. So that that's uh, simple as that. And so then from here, we need to write a function. So let's do function upload. And we'll do, uh, we'll do um, the events. And we'll do uh, the um, set state function as well. Uh, we can do async function upload. Cool. And then we can bring back on chain on, on change and we can do uh, pass the event to callback, we do upload E and then set state, which we declared above, right? And so uh, just to do a test real quick, make sure that works, test, click. Oh yeah, it will, it will work. <laughs> uh, so that's cool. Uh, and so then uh, we'll just change this upload here and we'll go and we'll uh, copy and paste um, this XHR request, and double check everything. So it changes the E because that will cause problems. Look at everything here, changes the E. Oh, did I introduce? Huh, how did that ever work? Where is the event declared? This should, this should be this, um, unless I can't read. Error in the doc, yeah. <laughs> Story of my life. Um, cool, so we'll try that out and then see what happens. We'll do it live. So do that. And then, yes, thank you. Thank you. Wow, everyone has my back this morning. Thank you so much. Let's use this API key. Teamwork, teamwork makes the dreams work. Is that right? Cool. And then we're gonna test it out. Let's see if this works. Yep, it worked. Wow, every nice teamwork make teamwork makes the dreams work. That's my motto. Uh, so cool, we're doing an upload right now. So that's how easy it is with the help of your friends to upload data straight to Filecoin. So if you do this, you pretty much have basically put data onto Filecoin. Uh, and we're hoping that it's simple for everyone 
uh, I know that Filecoin has been pretty complicated if you play with the bare metal, like I showed you in the um, keynote slides, if you play with the bare metal, it's this, it's a lot of stuff. And it's gonna, <laughs> it's, you're gonna have to go through a lot. If you use the S3 API, um, you can, it's as simple as this to upload data. And you can see that I'm uploading a pretty large file. This one's close to, um, I think, uh, many gigs. So yeah, that's pretty much it. We have uh, three minutes left. If you have any questions for me, um, please let me know. And I'll be sending invites. So, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Jimmy, for sharing uh, this uh, with everyone today. Uh, and also similarly for Jacob as well. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, do continue to keep them coming either on the chat or Q&A. Um, and once there are times, uh, uh, once we have time, we will get um, either Jacob or Jimmy, depending on what the question is, to actually uh, answer them as well. Uh, similarly, this session will actually be, be available uh, on YouTube, on Angel Hex, uh, YouTube. So if you missed out some of the parts or you would like to revisit any of the sessions for today, uh, do, do remember to go to Angel Hex uh, YouTube channel as well. So let me just cover some of the uh, uh, nitty gritty stuff for Mercury Hackathon as well. Uh, and just let me pull through, uh, just re-emphasize some of the information for you guys here today. Uh, so that, you know, uh, moving forward, we know what are some of the important questions, uh, important information to keep note of. Uh, as mentioned, there is always a leaderboard uh, where the top 100 people will actually get um, $150 worth of Filecoin tokens for you. And for those who fall after top 100, don't worry, we actually do have something in store for you and we will make an announcement on the coming week on Select channel as well. So just a quick recap, uh, what are some of the things that you can actually do to get yourself within the top 100 by gaining points? Firstly, and of course, most importantly, to join us on Slack, and that will be an el eligibility criteria for you to start earning points with us. And you can go through the resources that's actually available on the participants guide, or you can get active on our social media by leaving comments on any of the Angel Hack IG posts and tag three friends to actually get points or join our community events and definitely to submit a project as well. So like I said, the top 100 people will get flow tokens worth $150 for each, of the, each one of you who are within the top 100 as well. And you can always refer to the leaderboard on the participant guide to see where you are standing at this point of time. We do have a couple more events that are scheduled for the next few weeks on the Mercury Hackathon. We definitely have a virtual networking that's happening next week. If you have not registered, please go on to Slack channel to register it as well. Harish, who is our platform and community manager, will be constantly posting what are some of the key events that's actually happening as well for you to register and make sure that those are locked down on the calendar. Similarly, we do have a pitching workshop to help you work on your pitching video that is part of the submission requirements, and that will be the following Saturday. And last but not least, our submission closes on the 31st of October. You can always head over to the schedule and events on the participant guide to save the Mercury Hackathon event calendar if you have not done so. And you can also refer to that section to all the upcoming events that we do have as well. So quick recap, uh, one of the resources that's available are definitely our mentors and Jacob over here uh, is part of the mentor group that you can reach out to during the entire session as well. Mentor office hours happen on every Wednesday from 9 p.m. Singapore time to 12 midnight for three hours. And each of the appointment would be 20 minutes where you get to spend with any of your selected mentors. What you can do is book a slot via the booking system that's available on the participants guide as well and follow the instructions that's actually on the Google Sheet. What's most important and I'd like to highlight again, it's always for you to send a meeting invite with a, uh, with a meeting link to your mentor so that they have an avenue for, to connect with you and your team as well. So quickly, let me quickly cover some of the project submission matters. Firstly, it's the judging criteria. Each project are judge, judged 
by six criteria, namely the design, which is the user interface and user experience, whether or not it's well thought out, the novelty of the project, whether it's, whether it's original and whether it's innovative, we will judge the technical complexity as well, the mass usability, whether this project is adaptable across other integrations, of course, the creativity of the project, and last but not least, the social impact of the project, whether it fills a gap in the un universe and whether it has the potential to make the world a better place. Here are some of the artifacts that each of the team will need to submit as part of the submission requirements. They are namely the project sub description, a three minutes pitch video, a GitHub repo link, a list of text that used and a project demo link. These are all required for you to submit uh, before the submission closes on 31st of October. How you would submit your project is for each team to appoint a leader. And if you are hacking solo, you would be a team leader. You can head over to virtual.hackathon.io, which will only open on the 18th of October. And the team leader will need to create an account under Mercury Hackathon before he or she can start submitting all the required artifacts due, uh, for the um, project that you are submitting as well. Key rules to take note of uh, is that the platform will open for two weeks from 18th of October to 31st of October, and your time uh, for submission will cut off at 11.55 p.m. Singapore time, which is 9.25 p.m in IST, 5.55 p.m. CET, and 11.55 a.m. EST. Key rule that I'd like to highlight is that uh, for all the hackathon, all the projects uh, will be subjected to the fresh code rules, meaning that all the codes that's actually submitted for the hackathon will have to be written during the hacking period, which starts on 20th of September to submission closes. Last but not least, most importantly, I would like to urge everyone to grab every opportunity to learn, have fun, and connect with the community today. All the information from today can be found in the participants' guide that will be sent to your inbox after registration. For those who are watching us on YouTube Live, and if you have not registered for the hackathon, please feel free to head on to mercuryhackathon2021.com to register yourself. Um, you actually do have the link below in the description uh, box as well for you to click on it and to register as well. Similarly, if you need any help for those who are at the hackathon on Slack uh, or if you have not joined Slack as well, please do. You can reach out to two key person, namely myself, Justin, uh, which you can reach over Slack or over the email that you can see on screen over there. And you can reach out to Harish, our platform and community lead as well. His Slack and email is also over there. So before we end, uh, let me just get on some of the questions that we have uh, just for those people. Let me just quickly reach out to, I believe most of the people are asking on any questions for Jacob. All right. What we'll do is uh, we will get the speakers um, to reach out to you on Slack individually once you have any questions. Um, if there isn't any much for today, I would like to thank all of you for joining us for today. Uh, and most importantly, if you have not registered for the hackathon, do head on to mercuryhackathon2021.com to register yourself. And for those who have already joined us for the hackathon, please remember to head on to Slack to be updated on all the happenings. And if you have any questions for any of the mentors, do drop them in either the Flow help desk, the Filecoin help desk, or Filecoin and Flow help desk accordingly depend on what project that you are handling as well. So good luck for everyone. Uh, happy hacking, and please have a good day ahead. Goodbye, everyone.